Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is a constitutional law lecture by Sandy Lentasha Ngubande. A little disclaimer before we can proceed with our lecture. I am a second year law student at the University of KwaZulu Natal. I am not a lecturer or a trained educator. This is not in any way connected to the university. The notes in the slides may not act as a substitute for reading your prescribed reading materials. In this short lecture, we'll be talking about the structure of states and in doing that, we'll start by defining the word states. We'll also discuss the levels of government or spheres of government. The we'll talk about the unitary states, we'll talk about federations, we'll talk about quasi-federations, we'll talk about integrated quasi-federations, we'll talk about confederations, we'll talk about the current structure of the government, in South Africa and lastly the factors that prevent South Africa from becoming a true or a complete federation. The word states is very broad and we can define it in many ways but for our purposes we will define the word states as the regional areas in which a country such as the United States of America is divided or it can refer to the National Organization for the Governance of a Country. An example of the use of the word in this later context is where a criminal prosecution is brought by the state. In Britain, for example, which is a constitutional monarch, the monarch is the head of states. The word states in the national context is replaced with the word crown or some other reference to the monarch. And you'll hear a lot about the words crown courts, crown prosecution department, and rex or regina versus an accused. We can also define the word states as an organized political community occupying a certain territory and whose members live under the authority of a constitution. The states is therefore a far broader concept than the, than the government. To the levels of government, the levels of government are also known as the spheres of government. So many students confuse the levels of government with the branches or organs of government. The organs of government are the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. The legislature, which is the parliament, is seated in Cape Town. It's, it is made up of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. It actually makes laws and the executive carries out those laws. The executive is made up of the president and the ministers. The president is the head of the executive and we have the judiciary, which are the courts. The judiciary applies the laws to specific, co to specific court cases. So we have the organs of government at the different levels of government. The municipal level relates to the government of a borough, town or a city. So in the municipal level, this is where the most service delivery happens. This is where the, the government is brought closer to the people. And the provincial level relates to any governing bodies that regulate a, re a region of a country which is larger than the locality controlled at municipal level. So the provinces, the provinces, we in South Africa, we have nine provinces and we have we have the province the Guazul Natal province, we have the Western Cape province. So we have the each province has its own judiciary, each province has its own executive and legislature. So we have the organs of government at different levels of government. In the United States, they do not call them provinces, but they call them states. So we have the national level which is also called the central level in the national level we have the parliament which is the legislature we have the executive we have the judiciary so the powers of government are distributed at these different levels and the question of whether a country is organized on a unitary or federal basis depends on how the powers are distributed States. What exactly are, are we talking about when you are talking about the United States? In the United States, all the power is vested in the central legislature, which means the central legislature is the supreme law-making body in the country. 
Now, this does not mean that other legislative bodies do not exist. They can exist. In fact, in many United States, they do exist at both provincial and municipal level. But the national legislature can overrule them, and they are subordinates to it. So in a federation, they are not subordinates. They are coordinates. But in the United States, they are subordinates, which means uh, the national legislature can revoke or amend any powers that the regional legislators might have been given. So in the United States, uh, the national legislatures may choose to delegate some of its powers to the regional legislature, so the provincial legislature. And it can take away those powers. Uh, so it can rule on, it can pass laws on any matter. There is no entrenched division of power between the national legislature and the provincial legislature. But in a federation, there is entrenched division of power. The division of power is protected by the constitution. And in the United States, uh, the national legislature can give some of its powers to the provincial legislators and can revoke or amend those powers. So in a situation where the provincial legislature passes a law that is in conflict with the laws passed by the national legislature, in the United States, the laws passed by the national legislature will prevail. We have many countries which are regarded as the United States and some of them have become more decentralized because it is very hard to govern a country. It is very hard for the national legislature to have all the powers because there are many people. Most countries are very big. So we have New Zealand, France, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Norway, Denmark and Sweden as, as the United States and the United Kingdom have been has been regarded as a United States in the past, but the, the United Kingdom has become more decentralized. It has it has a separate legislature in Scotland and Wales, a limited home rule in Northern Ireland. So you can see that the UK has been has become more decentralized in character. So the UK now is more accurately regarded as decentralized unitary system in the style of pre-1994 South Africa. Prior to 1994, South Africa was divided into four provinces with provincial governments that possessed certain powers granted to them by parliament. But these powers could be revoked at any time by parliament which had sovereignty. It's a federation. In a federation, the powers of government are divided between the central legislature and the provincial legislature. Uh, the division of power is constitutionally entrenched. So a constitution would usually protect the division of power. It would give some powers to the provincial legislature and some powers to the central legislature. It's usually give areas in which the national legislature can pass laws and it gives areas in which the provincial legislature will pass laws. Most of the time, the national legislature will pass laws that affect the whole country and the provincial legislature will pass laws that only affect the people in that province. So the central legislature has limited powers and the leg and the provincial legislature has limited powers. And you'll also notice that in the United States, there is something called FBI. FBIs are law enforcers at a national level, at a central level. So it is the case with the uh, with legislation. So the FBI would handle crimes that affect the whole country, and the police of that state would handle crime that affects only that state. So same thing applies in the laws. The national legislature would pass laws that affect the whole country, such as the for, foreign inter, such as the for, for laws that affect tariffs and for, for foreign relations. And the 
provincial legislators would usually pass laws regarding uh, driver's license, those kind of laws that affect only the provinces. In the United States, uh, in some states, uh, for example, for one to have a driver's license, you'll have to be 16 years old, and in some states, you'll, you'll have to be uh, 18, uh, 18 years old. So, what is the difference between a federation and the United States? In a federation, uh, the provinces, the provincial legislature is subordinate to the national legislature. But in a federation, they are coordinates, which means in other words, the, as the national legislature has limited powers, it cannot go on to pass laws that regarding uh, pro, regarding the provinces, the laws affecting the provinces. The national legislature cannot also revoke or interfere with the powers of the regional governments, which means in other words, the national legislators cannot say from now on, uh, all, all the people, everyone will have to be 18 to have a driver's license because those laws only affect the provinces. It does not affect the country as a whole, which means they work together, the province the provincial legislature passed laws on some matters on some areas and the national legislature passed laws on some areas. One thing we use to categorize federations are residual powers. So the word residual means leftover. So when we say talking about residual powers, we are talking about leftover powers. For in a situation where the constitution will not expressly give, will not give neither the central legislature or the provincial legislature the power to to legislate in a certain area for example libraries if libra if the functional area libraries was left vacant so if it was not given that the national legislature may may legislate on libraries or the provincial legislature may not may legislate on libraries that power, that leftover power, will have to rest to, to, to the provincial legislature in a complete federation. So residual powers are leftover powers. So in a quasi federation, uh, the residual powers rest in the hands of the national legislature. That's why we call them uh, quasi federations because they are, they are not fully federation. Fe they are not fully federal. But in an orthodox federal system residual powers are left to the regional government so this means that any power not or, or function not expressly given to the central national government by the constitution automatically resides in the regional government in a quasi federation those powers automatically reside in the central government so that is the difference between a federation and a quasi federation so generally a federation can only exist where the constitution rather than the parliament is sovereign. Because if a national parliament is sovereign, it has the power to revoke the powers of a provincial legislator. Therefore, a country that has parliamentary sovereignty may never be a definition, may never be a federation by definition. So this, this means that uh, the the national legislature may revoke or amend any powers given to the provincial legislature because it is the supreme law making body but if the constitution is the supreme law making body the parliament cannot take those powers away but if the parliament is the supreme law making body it can amend the constitution it can take away those powers it can uh, at any time take away those powers that were given to the to the provincial legislature so it will say from now on uh, we will regulate on libraries and the provincial legislature would not be able to disagree with the provincial disagree with the national legislature because this is it is the supreme law making body but if 
the national legislature in a federation where uh, the constitution is the supreme even if this legislature wanted to take those powers away it will not be able it should be stopped because those powers are protected in the constitution which is which is the supreme law making body on the other hand another state has no special requirement regarding sovereignty a uh, unitary state may have a sovereign constitution or some other institution of government that is sovereign be it a parliament an absolute monarch such as it is the case with Switzerland or a dictator so one will ask how can a how can a state where the constitution is the supreme law making making body be a United States. This can happen because the Constitution can give all the powers to the national legislature. So if it gives all the powers to the national legislature, then it becomes a United States. The national legislature may choose to delegate those powers to the provincial legislature and take them away because the Constitution did not give any power to the provincial legislature. Federal states, in theory, are more democratic than United States, as the evolution of power allows more expression of the electorate's will at the local level. In effect, government is brought closer to the people. So what do we mean when you say government is brought closer to the people? So if the provincial government is independent, it can pass laws to help its people because it knows better, it knows its people better. In the national level, the, the national legislature that does not know every concern of every concern of every citizen. But in the federal states, uh, the government is brought closer to the people because the municipal, the municipal, at the municipal level, they will be able to pass laws. They will be able to be in depth, independent and serve its people. But in the United states. The government can also be brought closer to the people, but it's not very easy because the national government, the national legislature is the supreme law making body. So why do we say in theory, not in practice? In practice, in theory, yes, federal states are more democratic, but in practice, it must not be the case because we know that the central government controls the funding. So the regional government relies on the national government for funding so the national government or national legislature may use that to control the provincial legislature and we have the examples of federal states which are the united states of america nigeria australia and Switzerland. And in each case, the constitution sets out matters upon which the national legislature can make laws and reserves to the states, provinces, or cantons, or a sphere in which their legislature may make laws and may operate in legal independence of the national legislature. Quasi federations. When we say something is quasi, it means it is not completely. So it is very close to being a federation, but there are some factors that prevents it from becoming a fully a, a full or a complete federation. So a quasi federations are, syst are systems that contain both federal and inter elements, but lean more towards a federal system in practice as opposed to decentralized inter system. So what is the difference between a decentralized unitary system and a quasi-federation? Firstly, in a decentralized unitary system, the provinces does not have areas, areas or responsibility over which they can exercise exclusive authority and upon which the national government may not legislate. But it is not the case in a quasi-federation. A quasi federation in a quasi federation the provinces have areas of responsibility over which they can exercise exclusive authority and upon which the national government may not legislate and canada is an example of a quasi federation which means its 10 provinces have areas of responsibility over which they exercise exclusive authority and upon which the national government may not legislate so this is 
more federal. We'll expect something like that in a federal system. But although they have that, those areas of exclusive authority, the national executive may veto provincial bills and disallow provincial acts, even where these fall within the area of the province's exclusive authority. So you see that this is unitary. It is leans more on being a unitary because in a, in a decentralized unitary system, the provincial legislature may pass laws, may pass laws regarding some things, but the national legislature or the national government may veto those laws or may disallow or may revoke or amend those powers that were previously given to the provincial legislature. Also, unlike in this situation pertaining to state courts in the United States, judges for the state courts in Canada are appointed by the national government. So in the United States, judges for the states are appointed by the states, are appointed by the regional government. But in Canada, state judges are appointed by the national government. And the conclusive factor, something that really stops, that really prevents Canada from being a true or complete federation is residual powers. You know that we have said in a federation, all the residual powers are held by the provincial legislature or the regional legislature. But in the case of Canada, in a quasi-federation, any residual powers are held by the national legislature. Integrated quasi-federations. South Africa is an example of an integrated quasi-federation. In this system, there is an overlap in powers between the central legislature and the provinces. By that, we are referring to Schedule 4 competency in the Constitution, Schedule 4 competency, Schedule 4 competency uh, refers to the functional areas of concurrent national and provincial legislative competence, which means, in other words, uh, both the national and provincial legislature may pass laws regarding those areas listed in Schedule 4 competence. And there is also a provincial presence in the national legislature. By this, you are referring to the National Council of Provinces. Uh, the National Legislature of South Africa is made up of the National Assembly and the National Council of All Provinces. So that presence of the provincial, that provincial presence creates an overlap, thus an integrated quasi federation because you would not expect the provincial presence in a federation, in a complete federation and also in a unitary, in a unitary system because there is a limit because there is a limit, but in South Africa, there is a provincial presence in the national legislature. Therefore, it is an integrated quasi-federation. Confederations. In this system, individual sovereign states set up a common organization to regulate matters of common concern. Now, imagine uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and other neighboring countries forming a confederation. The individual states retain control over the central organization during a confederation. So, the instrument that regulates the central organization and holds the individual parts together is sometimes more in the nature of a treaty between separate states than the constitution of one state. So, if the constitution was to perform that role of that role which is usually performed by the treaty it will be a federation okay the most famous example was the confederate states of america although this was somewhat more federal than confederate in nature other examples were germany from 1871 to 1918 and the united and the united from 1579 a modern example is the European Union, which was, which has progressed from being an economic trade organization to take on some aspects of central government. Albeit in 
a limited fashion. An interesting example of a country which began with strong confederate elements was the United States of it was the United States before the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865. Although the United States was an authentic federation prior to 1861, it initially had relatively weak national institutions and government. The Civil War had a profound effect on the powers of individual states, and one of the results of the war was the clear negation of any right to secede that individual states might have had before 1861. So you'll see that confederations are very rare. The current structure of government in South Africa. As we all know, South Africa achieved democracy in 1994, which is not so long ago. So the system used in South Africa is an integrated quasi federation. So because we achieved democracy late than most of the countries, uh, we had the advantage of taking the most or taking the best parts in the systems in all over the world. And that is why the South African constitution is regarded as one of the best constitutions in the world because we took the best parts of, the, of most of the constitutions around the world. And after 1994, South Africa became a constitutional sovereignty, uh, which means it gave South Africa a choice because it is very easy to become a federation if the country, if the supreme law of the country is the constitution. Therefore, moving from a parliamentary sovereignty to a constitutional sovereignty gave South Africa an advantage. So, an integrated system. An integrated system provides for the regional organs of government to be represented in the national legislature. Uh, simply put, we are talking about the national council of provinces. And in my video that I'm going to upload, I will talk about how the regional organs of government are represented in the national council of provinces. Uh, the integrated systems also provides for an overlapping areas of authority between the national legislature and the provinces, hence the use of the term integrated. So the, here they are referring to uh, Schedule 4 competence, which are, I said that are the functional areas of current, concurrent national and provincial legislative, legislative competence, which means those are the functions which the national and the provincial legislature share. And I suggest that everyone go and read Schedule 4 competency, Schedule 5 and Schedule 6 competency and the cases that go, that refer to that case, that refer to the issue of Schedule 4 competency where there is conflict of laws. But I will also talk a little about them in the next slides. The South African Constitution provides for the provinces to be, to be represented in Parliament by means of a second house, the National Council of Provinces. So the National Council of Provinces is made up of the representative from all of the provinces. So as South Africa has nine provinces, uh, the National Council of Provinces have representative from all those provinces. So the interest of the provinces is well protected because of the National Council of Provinces. The integrated systems also provides for an overlap in functional areas of competence, hence the similarity to the integrated German system. And we all know that, the, that Germany is also an integrated quasi-federation, so South Africa took that from Germany. And although it is not uh, expressly written in the constitution that South Africa is 
and integrated class federations, it is implied because of the provisions in constitution that shows that South Africa is an integrated quasi federation. An integrated quasi federation has a quasi federation or federal elements. Uh, with regard to South Africa's structural status as a quasi federation, several elements are present. One of them is constitutional sovereignty. Uh, constitutional sovereignty is not an attribute which is unique to federal systems. In other words, unitary systems may also have constitutional sovereignty, but constitutional sovereignty is a fundamental prerequisite of federal states because it is almost impossible for unitary states, for a state where parliament is sovereign, sovereign to be a federal state because the national legislature has all the powers. Since 1994, the South, Africa, this, the South African constitution has had these attributes and section two of the, of the 1996 constitution provides that the South African constitution, constitution is the supreme law of the Republic. I assume we all know of the supremacy, of the supremacy clause. So, a very important issue, constitutional sovereignty. Constitutional sovereignty is a fundamental prerequisite in a federal system. And we talk about, we have talked about how a country is a federation because of constitutional sovereignty. Another element in the federal system is provincial structures. The existence of government at the provincial level is a necessary though not in itself conclusive element of the for the existence of a federal structure just imagine a federal state without provincial structures how are we supposed how is the state supposed to divide power how is the state supposed to divide power when there is no provincial structures so in certain states may not have been uh, provincial structures, but it is essential for pro for a federal state to have provincial structures. It, it must have a municipality, it must have a province, because if there are no provincial structures, then it is very difficult to share the power because there is no one to share the power with. Another element is the exclusive areas of authority. Now, this is a very important one. In the United States, there is no exclusive area of authority. Uh, the national legislature may pass laws in any functional area, but in a federal system, there are areas of exclusive authority, which makes this element, this federal element, be the one determining how integrated quasi federal systems lean more on being a federal rather than being a decentralized in inside states. So a country must have a, a exclusive areas of authority for it to be a federation. Provinces have their own exclusive areas of authority. They are also very significant areas of overlap with the authority of the national government. We have talked more about uh, Schedule 4. We have talked about Schedule 4, although I may, cannot be able to read or list all the functional areas in Schedule 4. But in an integrated quasi federation, the government or the national government can interfere with other areas which are of exclusive authority to the provinces and they share some areas some functional areas uh, the national legislature and the provincial legislature share some functional areas and we'll talk about wh what happens when there is conflict when there is conflict between the laws passed by the national legislature and the provincial legislature. But the 
the municipalities have the municipalities have no functional areas of competence that are not subject to oversight from the provincial administrations. That's why we have not talked more about the municipality. Well, the municipal the, the municipalities have their constitution, they have their functional areas of competence, but they are subject to oversight from, from the provincial legislature administrations. In other words, the municipalities, the municipalities do pass bylaws, but those bylaws are subject to oversight from the provincial legislature. Factors that mitigate against the federation, intervention, conflicts and residual powers. Now, this is their favorite questions asked in a test or exam. Better listen and you better study it very well. So, there are several factors preventing South Africa from being a true federation. Firstly, an important test is the power of the national legislature to intervene in an area of provincial competence in specific instances. Secondly, is the question of which level of governance prevails in the case of a conflict between national legislation and provincial legislation. Thirdly and lastly is the question of where any residual powers not specifically provided for in the constitution reside. Intervention. Section 44 subsection 2 of the 1996 constitution permits the parliament to intervene in provincial affairs by passing legislation with regard to a matter falling within an exclusive functional area of the provinces listed in Schedule 5 when it is necessary for national security to maintain economic unity, to maintain essential, essential standards, to establish minimum standards required for the rendering of services, and to prevent unreasonable action taken by a province which might be prejudicial to the interest of another province or to the country as a whole. In the Liquor Bill case, the courts interpreted the word necessary in, in section 44 of section 2 to mean that there must be no other alternative. Mm. This means that the national legislature can only intervene in exceptional circumstances. The courts held that, held that these circumstances did not exist regarding legislating on retail liquor licensing. However, they were justified in legislating on the wholesale and manufacture of liquor, of liquor since there will be cross-border interaction. Now, this is a very in important case and you should read it. You should be able to remember it and it will earn you marks in your exam or test. Conflicts. A national section 146 provides for conflicts between national legislation and provincial legislation in respect of any of the functional areas listed in Schedule 4 concurrent competency. It stipulates that national legislation, which applies uniformly over the country as a whole, prevails over provincial legislation, provided that certain conditions relating to the need for national uniformity or security listed in section 146 are met. This section therefore provides a mix of outcomes in a clash between national and provincial interest. The main idea, however, is that the national government may intervene in respect of the functional areas that are within the concurrent area of competence of the national and provincial legislature. Finally, if the courts are unable to resolve a dispute concerning a conflict between national legislation and provincial legislation or a provincial constitution, national legislation prevails in terms of section 148. In the Utsugela case, the in the case and others, the court held that where they, that they were, there is a general duty on organs of states to avoid legal proceedings against each other. Section 41, subsection 3 
provides that organs of state must make every reasonable effort to settle the disputes by means of mechanisms and procedures provided for and must exhaust all other remedies before approaching a court. Section 147, subsection 1 generally treats the provincial constitutions as provincial legislation and therefore achieves a similar effect to that imagined in section 146 and 44 to, to which it specifically mentions with national legislation prevailing. In other words, the provincial constitution where in a situation where the provincial constitution is in conflict with the national con constitution, the national constitution will prevail. The effect of all these sections is that the national legislature can intervene in provincial governance in a wide-ranging set of circumstances. In the case of conflicts with provincial legislation or provincial constitution, national legislation will generally, if not in all circumstances, prevail. This certainly reduces the possibility that South Africa might be a federation. In a situation of conflict, the South African constitution favors more the national legislation. But in a federation, in a true federation, it is, more, it is unlikely that there will be a conflict because there is no concurrent area. There is no concurrent functional area. So this plays a huge part in preventing South Africa from becoming a federation. To the issue of residual powers, we have talked a little bit about residual powers and I'm afraid there is nothing more to say about residual powers, but we'll go ahead and talk about it anyway. The only issue that remains in the, is the question of where any residual powers not specifically provided for in the Constitution reside. Section 44.1a gives the National Assembly power to pass legislation with regard to any matter, including a matter within a functional area listed in Schedule 4, but excluding subject to subsection 2, a matter with a, fun a functional area listed in, in Schedule 5. A provincial legislature, however, is empowered by Section 104 one B only to pass a legislation with regard to matters within the functional areas listed in Schedule 4 and 5. Those matter, those matter, matters assigned to provinces by national legislation and any matter for which a provision of the constitution imagined the, the enactment of provincial legislation. This means that the national legislature has authority to enact legislation in respect of any area except those from which it is specifically prevented by the constitution. Whereas the provincial legislature lectures may only pass legislation in respect of those areas over which they have been specifically given authority. So you understand that the national legislature can pass any laws except when it is prevented by the constitution and if they can pass laws if they can prove that it was necessary. The result is that any power not specifically given to the provinces resides to the national legislature. So in a federation it doesn't work that way. Any power not specifically given to the national legislature resides in the provinces. This prevents South Africa from being regarded as a federation, but enough federal elements exist to regard South Africa as a quasi-federation -feder rather than a unitary state. This brings us to the end of our lecture. I'm Sandy Lentasa, Ringubande. Uh, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I hope to see you next time.